Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Barbell Mamas podcast. Uh, Christina Previtt here, and this week we are going to be deep diving into all things diastasis recti. In this week's episode of Where is Christina Recording This Podcast, the answer is Oregon. Um, I was last week, I was in California as I was recording this, and we were doing a podcast episode after I had taught our geriatric course. I stayed in the West Coast, so I'm in Ontario, I'm in Canada. And we're on Eastern time. So we're kind of central to Eastern side of the Canadian, um, on the Canadian side of the border, but getting to the West coast to teach back-to-back courses, it actually was cheaper for me to stay in, uh, in Oregon. So, uh, I'm here, but horribly, horribly homesick. And it's been a long time since I've been away from our, my kids for this long. And it's been uh, kind of a struggle because it's only three hours, the time difference between where I'm at and where I am now, but it makes a difference for kiddos. You know, like my kid goes to school at eight o'clock or eight 30, that's five 30 this time. So unless I'm getting up super, super early, I'm missing her in the morning and ditto at night when I'm finishing doing some work at four or five in the morning or four or five at night, it's seven or eight o'clock at night, uh, Eastern time. So it's been a bit of a struggle being able to get um, some up some windows of time to be able to talk to them. But um, that is the mom life of loving your job, but also just yearning to be home. And that that conflict or sense of self is like something that I'm very acutely aware of, especially in weeks like this. Um, but anyways, when we're going to talk today, we're going to talk today about all things diastasis recti. And Um, I'm going to start out with like kind of my declaration around diastasis recti in that the TLDR is that our social media spaces has created more fear than there needs to be, number one. And number two, I cannot think of a single circumstance where the exercises that you select to do are going to make your diastasis recti worse. I'm not saying that it's impossible, um, but I'm going to say that it is would be very challenging to do that. And um, saying that you're gonna ruin your core because of the core exercises you choose to do um, is not evidence informed. And so I really do wanna take an empowerment focused message to diastasis recti um, and really try and give you the information and blend some of my clinical experience with what we see in the research um, to give a more holistic view of what diastasis recti is and what it is not. And so um, hopefully you guys will stick with me. And if you have any questions, just make sure you let me know. So the first thing that we have to start with is some definitions. So what is diastasis recti? So diastasis recti is a separation, or I'm not going to say separation. I'm going to say an elongation or a stretching of the linea alba muscles. So I shouldn't have used the word separation because that is not what it is. It is a elongation of the six pack muscles. And so when we think about our core wall, we think about the muscle that we see that makes us have a six pack is called our rectus abdominis. And in the middle is our linea alba. And that can be stretched or elongated for a variety of different reasons. Um, And when we are looking for diastasis recti, we are, as a clinician, I am looking for the distance between those two recti muscles when you lift your head. So that's going to be part of the evaluation. We'll talk about that in a second. The strength of that tissue when you are lifting your head. And then sometimes the output that we talk about a lot in the social media spaces are coning or doming, which is like this tenting or this popping up that happens when we are doing core focused exercises Um, when we are working potentially through rehab for diastasis recti. So we are looking at the distance between the two core muscles. We are looking at how strong that that tissue is, that linea alba is. And then in exercise, we're often looking at honing or doming. Okay. When we are thinking about diastasis recti and we are trying to diagnose it and even the idea of diagnosing it, it's something that's, it's a really tough thing to think about is the first thing we have to consider is what is normal. And I even hate the word normal. I'm like struggling because there's so much semantics to this condition. We oftentimes will use two finger breaths or about an inch of distance when you are lying on your back with your, your knees up 
and I ask you to lift your head so that your shoulders come off the, the bed or the plinth or the floor, whatever I'm assessing you on. And I am feeling for your two rectus muscles coming together. And I'm trying to see the distance between your two muscles, what your core wall is doing. And if there is a good amount of spring. So that's the assessment. We lie on our back, our knees are up. And then I'm going to ask you to lift your head and you're going to feel those two muscles come together. And then I feel for that on the top of your belly button, about an inch off your belly button at the level of your belly button and an inch below. And sometimes you'll kind of go all the way from your pubic bone up towards your rib cage and we'll kind of see what your core wall is doing. But in terms of the way that the research has described diastasis recti and how we assess it, those are the three spots. And the level that we're looking at is two finger breaths. The really interesting part about this is that we have a really hard time figuring out where that two finger breaths piece came from. And just last year, there was a study that was done that was not specific to individuals who are pregnant or postpartum, but was done in women across a variety of different ages. And they saw, saw that on average, every single person that came in, it was like 2.1 centimeters or just over an inch, which was like above the two centimeter mark was the average for everyone. And when we think about average, we have to think that like, you know, there's 50% above the average 50% below, like where the grouping is coming in. And it made us start to question, you know, is two centimeters appropriate? Is it what we're looking for? Is it the gold standard? Is there actually a lot of variability that we don't need to be afraid of? The jury's still out on that, you know, like we, we are thinking about these things a lot and we are really starting to change our understanding of diastasis recti and what like the, the, the standard that we're trying to find or return back to is because there is a lot of variation. So if you are a person who has two and a half finger breaths or three fingers, like do not think that that is not normal for you, especially if you don't have a baseline. But in general, like the, that is kind of the distance that we are saying as anything above that two finger breaths, maybe somebody that we classify as having diastasis recti. And then when we're thinking about where diastasis recti comes up, right, we talk about this a lot in the pregnant and postpartum space is how do we try and rehab individuals with diastasis recti, especially postpartum. But before we kind of dial in on the pregnancy postpartum piece, what I want to make sure that is really understood is that having diastasis recti or coning or doming being present is not a pregnant postpartum only consideration. We see coning, for example, with movement happen in all sorts of different people. Anybody who's challenging their core wall, you know, I see it in newborns. Like when your baby is brand, brand new and they do not have the strength to be able to sit up, like you're going to see doming or coning of those individuals. Some individuals who are just a little bit more bendy, their ligaments are a bit more bendy. They're, those two recti muscles are going to be a little bit further apart and they're super lean, but we're seeing some invagination or like a kind of a cratering in between their two rectus muscles. And you can see this in bodybuilders. I see this all of the time in some of my older adults who don't have the core strength that they need. And so they start to experience things like doming across their ab wall when they have maybe put on more weight or when they've lost some strength along their core wall. And so this is not just a pregnant postpartum issue, but the fear is focused in pregnancy and postpartum. So kind of narrowing in, in this space, there's a lot of messaging around doing things that are going to avoid strain on the core wall so that we can try and prevent diastasis recti from happening or persisting in the postpartum period. The first thing I'm going to say is that diastasis recti happens in every single pregnancy. We have this elongation of the rectus muscle on purpose because it is a beautiful 
mechanism that we have created in order for baby to grow, right? After the first trimester, as you get into the second trimester and baby starts to pop out of the pelvis, as baby gets bigger, it's going to cause more, it's going to, your baby's going to take up more space in your, your belly. And so in order to make room for baby to grow and for our abdominal contents to still feel like they have some space, even though they feel super squishy towards the end of the third trimester, you have to have that, that, that elongation happen at the linea alba. It has to happen. And it is not something to be afraid of. It is something that we see occur. And if your baby is bigger or you have a shorter torso or you are carrying twins, those are going to th be things that are going to make your linea alba have to stretch more versus if you're taller, if you have a longer torso, you have only a single baby, that maybe there won't be as much. But that's all going to be individual and that is all in the realm of normal. That is not something that you should be afraid of. The second thing that we get told is, that we should not do any core work because there's already so much strain on the muscle and we don't want to put it under more strain. To be honest, I think this is pure crap. Like that is not what we want to do at all. If we have an increased demand on the core muscles, that means that those core muscles need to stay strong so that we can meet that increase in demand. Deconditioning the core muscles isn't the answer. Now, are we going to do all of the same exercises? Well, maybe. Um, or we might may change or modify them to just respect where your body is in pregnancy. But this idea that you should avoid core exercises during your pregnancy is absolutely not what we want to be doing. And actually, like in the last probably two years, I really started to push core training in all of our Barbara Mamas programs, in my own pregnancies, in my clients' pregnancies, and they have done incredibly well. And our rates of postpartum diastasis recti or, you know, loss of strength across the core wall is a lot lower than it was when I was a bit more tentative about it. Um, and so absolutely, we do not want to avoid core training during pregnancy. We actually want to encourage it. It's not a do not do core training. We want to encourage core training during pregnancy. What that looks like might be a little bit different, but it also might not be, you know, um, Tia was one who she was doing core exercises during pregnancy and she was getting a lot of crap for it online. And the thing was, is that her, her two ab muscles stayed really strong during her pregnancy. And so she saw this coming together of her ab wall really quickly postpartum. Now she is an elite level athlete. I'm not comparing myself to Tia, but um, it was an example where very publicly individuals were kind of trolling her in the comment section, being like, you're going to have all these persistent issues. And it just ended up not being true. And then the third thing is around, around pregnancy is around doming or coning. Do we need to avoid it? The answer is we don't know, but the, probably not. We probably don't need to be as adamant about avoiding, uh, avoiding doming or coning during pregnancy. Like I have seen things online that have said you should not sit up from a chair because it puts too much strain on your core wall during pregnancy. And you should like shimmy over to the side in order for you to stand up or to go from a reclined position to sitting up. You do not need to do that. You do not need to avoid that. Like that is like the least amount of strain on your core wall. Like do not think that you have to modify all of your activities in order to do that. I have actually had individuals continue to do sit-ups because they have good strength across their core wall up until delivery. I did sit-ups until I was like 34 weeks pregnant with my second and it was totally fine. Um, we do not have any evidence that avoiding coning or doming during pregnancy makes diastasis recti worse. I know some of you are probably listening to this and be like, but people are so confident. And I was like, I know, but I don't know why. <laughs> um, we do not have that evidence. It is based purely on theoretical constructs. And personally, the theoretical constructs I do not agree with. And I do not create fear around doming or coning. Here's what I do do though. When we have doming or coning that occurs during pregnancy, sometimes it is a sign that we are just not in the strongest position, 
right? When we have doming or coning, it means that we are not getting as much recruitment of all of the muscles in our core as we may necessarily need, or that could we do it a different way that's going to create more strength across our ab wall, right? So I will coach away from doming or coning to make you feel stronger, not out of a fear that you are going to make something worse, you are going to ruin your pelvic floor or that you are going to have diastasis recti postpartum. We know in the postpartum period that those that are weaker are more likely to have persistent diastasis recti. And we'll talk about the postpartum period in a sec. And so deconditioning our core wall or thinking that if we're avoiding anything that strains our core wall, that we are actually protecting from diastasis recti postpartum. We don't have any research to support that. And my thoughts, my hypotheses is that it's actually the opposite that the stronger we stay during pregnancy in our core wall, which means that sometimes we're going to dome, sometimes we're going to cone, and I'm not going to stress about it. I'm going to try and minimize it, but I'm not going to stress about it. The better we tend to do postpartum. When we are thinking about being in the third trimester, when we are testing our rectus muscle, our two six pack muscles come together when we do a head lift. With a stretched linea alba, a necessarily stretched linea alba, when those come together and the, muscle, the ligament is stretched, that fascial tissue is stretched, that little popping up or tenting movement is not something that would worry me. It's actually something that I would expect towards the end of pregnancy. Like when you're in the end of the third trimester and baby is growing really quickly, that stretching tissue, when we have it come together, there might be air pockets or a bit of a tenting up that occurs at the fascia because of those two recti muscles coming together and the current stretch on your ligament because you are pregnant. It also makes me think that it may not be something that we need to cue out or something that we can realistically assume is going to be completely avoided all of the time. One of my really nerdy research brain questions is, if we took an individual and had them completely avoid coning or doming versus another group where we got them to really strengthen their core wall, who do you think would do better in the postpartum period? From a pure function perspective in the postpartum period, it is a very vulnerable place being in the early postpartum period. Your body does not feel like your own. You are leaking from the breast. You are recovering either your abdominals or your pelvic floor or both. And you feel very weak. That was a really vulnerable place for me to be. I felt it super acutely with my daughter, my eldest. And I didn't feel it as much postpartum with my son. And I really truly attribute that to the fact that I kept my core wall stronger. And I was a little bit more intentional with core training during my pregnancy with my son. You're also kind of, you know what to expect. So you kind of, you get back to things a little bit faster just because you have to, because you have another kiddo. Um, but it definitely was a different experience. And the amount of reserve that we can keep. We're going to have some deconditioning that happens during pregnancy, but the stronger we can keep you, um, the less vulnerable, I think we can feel in at least the physical side of postpartum. You know, we have, there's a huge emotional, mental, you know, trauma informed side that we have to consider as well. But from the purely physical side, um, it's something that we can do to try and set ourselves up for success. And that doesn't just mean, you know, I'm talking to a lot of CrossFitters and barbell athletes, but that can be a whole bunch of different types of exercise that encourage use of those core muscles. So all of these things during pregnancy, number one, we do not need to be afraid of diastasis recti. It happens in hundred percent of pregnancies. Number two, we want to continue strengthening the core wall. This idea of reducing strain on the core wall is not something that I support or agree with. And number three is that doming or coning may not be as bad as we think it is. And it might be just a natural consequence of our rectus muscles at rest being further apart because there's a baby there in our belly. So these are three things that I really want you to think about to hopefully reduce a lot of the fear you may have during pregnancy. If you got up from a reclined position and you coned, like that is fine. Like I am not worried about that at all. You did not ruin anything. You did not ruin anything. 
All right, let's go into the postpartum period. When we are considering diastasis recti postpartum, we see a natural history where the amount of space between our two rectus muscles does get better with just time. We see that, you know, about two thirds of individuals at their six week checkup can still have a bigger than two centimeter gap between their two rectus muscles that goes down to about one in three by 12 months postpartum without any type of intervention. We are going to see some improvement. You will see some healing as your body gets stronger, as you get further from birthday and you get back into some of your movement routines. What we also see is that individuals who have diastasis recti postpartum, the biggest evidence we have around what causes diastasis recti to stick around postpartum are BMI, so our weight, our genetics, so what our ligaments tend to do, how bendy we are, what our predispositions are with respect to our genetics. And the mo biggest modifiable risk factor is our strength. Those that have persistent diastasis recti postpartum are weaker than those that don't. And that again, makes me one, not want to decondition you in pregnancy and two, feel extremely confident that we want to strengthen the core wall. And again, we're going to try and minimize that coning. But if you go from, you know, uh, three centimeter kind of cone down to a one centimeter cone. I am absolutely okay with that. And sometimes the just get stronger piece is really important. When we are thinking about your progressions, we want to be really intentional about that postpartum, right? We want to start with lower level exercises. And we've done a lot of videos on this on the Barbara Mama account and then progress things. For our CrossFit athletes, like the amount of strength you need in your core wall is really intense, right? We can't just be doing bird dogs and dead bugs, though we will start there. If you want to get back to GHDs and toast bar, we need to have this progression and we can use things like, are you getting good recruitment of all the muscles in your belly, which can show up as minimal doming or coning to show that you're having a good strength across your ab wall before we progress to other things. So we can absolutely use that as a signal, um, but we don't have to use it as a fear focused mechanism that your body isn't ready for it. There are going to be times when you are doing exercises that I do not want you hyper fixated on checking if you are doming or coning or not. I want you to focus on your points of performance. I want you to say, are you in the right position? Is your rib cage tucked down over your pelvis? Is your back flat against the, the floor if it needs to be? If you're in a plank position, are you keeping that rib cage tucked over your belly or is your butt too high in the air? Is it sagging down too close towards the floor? Those coaching cues are going to promote you getting the best ab recruitment that you can in order to try and get as strong as possible. We are going to take a really gradual approach, right? Going to a fitness professional or going to a pelvic floor physical therapist to help you figure out those progressions is super valuable. In all of our postpartum exercise programs, we have core training integrated into the app, um, but it's not a ton of things in like dead bugs and, and isometric work because we want to get you back to the movements that are important to you. And so your rehab is going to look like those movements. And we're going to break them down and we're going to do them as accessory movements. And we're going to chart, start working on developing that strength as a system across your ab wall. Another thing is that when we are talking about the research in diastasis recti postpartum, a lot of things that we are focusing on is your function. How strong is your ab wall? How strong is it relative to the rest of your body? And how comfortable and confident do you feel in doing the things that you need to be able to do in order for you to move about your day successfully, right? That type of function is going to increase the strength of that linea alba. It's going to increase the strength of all the components of your ab wall. And it's going to be really important for your recovery postpartum. But what it is not looking at is your belly's look at rest. 
And so a lot of our interventions and even the way that we look for diastasis recti is in a very active position, right? We're trying to get you to lift your head. We're trying to get you to do a crunch in order for you to see what your ab wall is doing. That doesn't give us information about what your belly looks like at rest. And for a lot of people, that is one of their bigger concerns, if not their bigger concern over what their, their function is. And when it comes to return and exercise and some of the considerations for postpartum diastasis recti, we do not have a ton of confidence or predictive power for changing resting position. And I try to be very upfront about that. Do we see clinically that as your belly gets stronger, that resting position tends to be a bit better? Yes. Do we have research that is looking at this? No. Is there going to be a different look to your belly from pre-pregnancy to postpartum? Yes. Are some people going to look exactly the same as they did before pregnancy, postpartum? Also, yes. But many of those considerations about what your belly looks like outside of regaining your strength from a postpartum compared to where you were before pregnancy is genetics. Look at like Annie Thoris daughter. Annie Thoris daughter is a CrossFit athlete who uh, had her little one Freya three years ago, just over three years ago. And she is jacked. She has gotten back to all of her function. She has a six pack, but she has a bit more distension and she kind of had them a little bit before pregnancy, but it's definitely more pronounced now um, in her abdomen. Uh, we see even with well-muscled athletes, there is a bit more distension. There is a bit more, um, if you are bloated, it can uh, show up a bit more in your ab wall. Maybe the extent of your bloating can increase compared to before you had babies. And that is some of the, the changes that our physiology has gone through because we have gone through pregnancy once or twice or three times or four times. Um, that sometimes may not be in the realm of possibility for us to change. And this kind of goes into like some of the last topic that I wanted to, to bring about. And then I'll, I'll kind of do some like key concepts for postpartum um, help with diastasis recti. And so the resting position piece, um, individuals um, can have a, a conversation of, do they want to do surgery for diastasis recti? And this is an abdominal plasty or a tummy tuck which is a major surgery. So they will do an incision that if you think about your C-section scar, it's probably about twice as long. So it'll go from basically hip bone to hip bone and they'll um, bring the two rectus muscles and they'll kind of stitch the linea alba closer together in order to change the resting position of your two rectus muscles. I am not opposed to surgery. I am absolutely in support. If somebody, this is their decision that this is what they want to do. Everybody's comfort level with the way that their belly looks and the, the acceptance that they have of their belly is going to be different. But I also do want to lay out different expectations when it comes to prepping for something like an abdominal plasty. And I'll shout out Lisa Marie Ryan. She is a fitness professional who had a very significant diastasis recti went through an abdominal plasty and then has been very open about her journey and expectations around that journey. And I encourage you to go check, take a look at her account because she has some wonderful stuff out there. But when you are thinking about an abdominal plasty, you're thinking one, that the recovery is quite long. You know, you have some of your initial kind of healing in that first six weeks, but you're going to be seeing very big changes to things like your bloating and the way your belly looks in the morning to at night, potentially permanently, but definitely in the first six to 12 months, there's going to be a lot of variation and a lot of swelling management in this surgery because it is really hefty. Like it is a big surgery for you to be going through. It's a big abdominal surgery. And I want you to be aware of that, that it's not just like you take the six weeks to have the, um, some of the initial healing. And then all of a sudden there is none of that swelling management or all those types of things. Like this is a six to 12 months of really seeing a lot of variability in that, uh, that incision and, and some of that rehab. The second thing is that 
you need a prerequisite amount of strength in your belly wall, even if you get surgery, right? Like that doesn't, that changes the ligament that does not change the muscle belly. And so if there is a weakness issue in the muscle belly, that is still something that needs to be addressed. It can be done together. It can be done in tandem with each other. Um, but don't think that one is in replacement of the other. You still need that function across the core wall and you don't want to, um, not have that strength because it's so important for us just being able to move around. And, and, you know, we say all the time that momming requires fitness. And so, um, something to think about that it is not a replacement of the work that you need to do in order to get your core wall to be strong and something to be thinking about. And then the, the third thing is that the abdominal plasty changes a lot of resting position. So that's where somebody would be considering those types of, um, those types of surgeries and the incision that is lower, as I said, it is quite large. And some people, I want to just, you know, bring it out there that it is a big scar that you're going to see from hip bone to hip bone. Um, and, and what you want to think about with respect to if you're okay with that big incision. So those are all kind of things that we would counsel on if you were thinking about an abdominal plasty, and then it would kind of be all of this like postpartum diastasis recti strengthening rehab would be in conjunction conjunction with some of our post-surgical management tools that we would be using in order to help you get back from the surgery. And I would encourage you to see a physical therapist if this is a surgery that you're going through, because that guidance will be so, so instrumental and helpful. Um, and you know, Lisa Marie Ryan has, I think she has a course on abdominal plasty recovery. I'm not sure if it's for fitness professionals, clinicians, or uh, individuals going through the surgery, but, um, seek out some of those resources who are going to give you a empowerment focus, but also just realistic idea of what that recovery is going to look like, because you're being informed going into that surgery is just going to be so helpful. Like there's a lot where if you thought that after six weeks, it was going to be 100% back to where it was, there could be a lot of uh, emotions and feelings that come in uh, after you think about that surgery. Okay. So final thing that I wanted to go through before we wrap up for today is around how do we approach rehab for individuals with diastasis recti? So the first thing is that we're going to start slow and progress. So we're going to start in neutral. We're going to start with things like planks and pale off presses, um, isometric side bends, carries. Those types of things are exercises that we're going to start with, right? We're going to think about integrating into the, the core wall. Um, we may try and work on recruitment of some of these deep core muscles, Sometimes we just don't want to stay there too long. I see people staying there way too long and really we just need to work on getting you stronger. Um, but using that coning or doming as a sign of where your fatigue point is, where your muscle strength is, can be really wonderful to figure out if you're ready for a progression. From neutral, we want to focus on intentional strengthening through range of motion. And where you're going to focus it should be kind of in all directions, but it's also going to be kind of dependent on your sport. So for example, with my CrossFitters, you need to have strength through a big range of flexion and extension for GHGs and toast bar and all of our kipping movements. So I'm going to be focusing a lot on getting you strong through that toe touch all the way to that big back bend. And that can be with a sit up going over a wall ball, starting with GHGs to neutral, and then going down to risers to start working on that strength, working on some of your kipping mechanics is also going to help with that. But for other athletes, or even just for life, we want to be able to have a good amount of strength through not just neutral, because we're not always going to stay hips over pelvis, but for flexion, extension, rotation, right? Where if you're uh play, volleyball or soccer or any type of ball sport, like that rotation piece and generating power through your core in rotation is super important. So things like uh, Russian twists or pale off presses with a rotation component are super helpful as like next steps after you feel pretty good in neutral or in addition to some of the exercises you're doing in neutral. And then also in side bend, right? So things like windmills or Kettlebell side bends are ways for us to get 
range of motion and strength in different planes of movement. So when we are considering our rehab program, are we doing just flexion extension? Are we getting side bend rotation as well? And are we not just staying in ribs over pelvis, but are we also going through a full range of motion? Because we can try and stay in neutral and it's probably our strongest position, but also like I think about putting a baby in a crib, like I'm kind of in this rounded back position and I need to stay strong. Like the amount of times I am grabbing things from behind and doing that rotation piece with kiddos in the back seat, like all of those things are just life. And we want to be able to feel strong and supported in our core wall um, across all of those different ranges. And that can be really incorporated into our exercise programs. And then finally, um, kind of things to think about is that progressive overload here is super important. And when we are thinking about that, if we're going in a really sequential manner and we are doing our steps to kind of stick to our good positions, even if we have a little bit of coning and doming, I am not that worried about it because I know that by getting stronger, the amount of load and the amount of exercise that our core wall is going to be able to withstand is going to be better. So do not stress if you are having some coning or doning, or the big thing is, do you not know? Because it's really hard when you're doing toast bar to see every single time if you're doing a cone or dome, um, your muscles are going to fail. And that's going to be your big like uh, sign that you're not there yet. And that's okay. So try not to stress, you know, get periodic checks of your positions for readiness. That'll give you peace of mind. Um, but don't think that you have to be hyper fixated on your core wall. Every time you're doing exercise, like if this is your permission, I am giving you permission, um, that you can focus in strength and conditioning and getting stronger and you're not going to be ruining or, or causing persistent diastasis recti postpartum. You don't have any of that evidence. Um, and just kind of be mindful of your progressions and don't increase your volume or increase your intensity too quick. And you will be good to go with respect to uh, reintegrating into all the movements that you love in the postpartum period. All right. I hope you found that helpful. If you have any other questions about diastasis recti, I know that I'm kind of like a hot take around uh, diastasis recti. We've really changed our tune. I know I have a lot in the last two years and I've just seen so many positive benefits with my patients. And it, it probably makes people think, why is there not a just an absolute ton of core retraining work and breath work in the Barbell Mamas programs. And the reason why is because we want you to get stronger and in order to get stronger, we need to challenge your system. And so um, we don't stay at the early postpartum kind of breath reintegration too, too long, but we rely on breath strategies when they are needed as we are returning to our activities. So um, let me know if you have any other questions. I hope this made sense. This is a huge topic and there's a lot of nuance in it. So I tried to make it digestible, but if you have any other questions and you want me to deep dive into other areas, um, just let me know. Otherwise, have a really wonderful week. You're going to see me in my normal place next week. Uh, we have some interviews that we're about to line up. So super excited about that. Hope you all have a wonderful week and we will see you all next time.